And let the church say, yeah. Amen. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for brothers and sisters, our leaders, our overseers, everyone here. We're asking, Lord, that you reach every life with your word, even today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let this word penetrate every area of our lives. Our heart, our spirit, our soul, our body, our mind, our brain, every part. Turn us around in Jesus' name. Amen. Prepare us, get us ready for the coming of our loving Savior. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're looking at Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. Here the Lord is telling us about his grace. The grace that came through Jesus Christ. Because we're told is full of grace and full of truth. And that grace has appeared as Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. And he made all grace available. He passed it on to the hands of the apostles and the disciples. And he went about everywhere. And he touched every place that even the people of the world said, the people who have turned the world upside down, they come hither also. They went to every city they could reach, every town, every village they could reach. And they went to the, all the places where human beings were. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And they heard about grace. They heard about God, the God that so loved the world and gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And they heard about the love of God that covers everyone, universal, that calls everyone, that wants to convert, change, and transform every life. And that grace of God came to those individuals and he said, now as the grace appeared, look at what it does in verse 12 teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world the world was full of darkness the world was full of unrighteousness they were graceless and godless before grace came unto them now grace appeared to everyone and as they were receiving the gospel, accepting the gospel, transformation was coming. A change of life came on them. The grace in them was not dormant. It was active, powerful, mighty. And it taught them, trained them, that's the word actually, transformed them to be righteous, to be sober, to be godly. In this very pleasant world. And then it's not just that something was done at Calvary in the past. Something is happening now. Grace is given to us. They were looking forward. The past, the present, the future. When grace comes to us, it affects our past. The past is forgotten. The past is forgiven. The past is turned around and changed, and the present is renewed. And we're not today like we were yesterday. Grace has come, and now righteousness, holiness has come into our lives. But then it lifts us up to the future, and it says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Many of the people that received the impartation of the grace of God never saw him physically. But now they were looking forward. He saved me. I will see him. He sanctified me. I will see him. And he has filled me with the Holy Ghost. I will see him. He has healed me. I will see him. How eager they were that they will see the coming king and the coming Christ, how eager they were, and therefore they were longing, and they were desiring that when he comes, they will see him, and then they understood that if they were going to see him, blessed at the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord, and who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? 
who shall stand in his holy place he that has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity therefore they understood that what christ has done at calvary twofold salvation sanctification twofold forgiveness freedom there was to be a cleansing of the outward sin and redemption totally from the inbred sin and so you have verse 14 who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people a unique people a distinguished people a different people a people of a new species of a new kind this has never been this is brand new this one is made in heaven there is a supernatural grace unique and different that comes to the life of the one that comes to know the lord and he knows the lord in experiential sanctification and it says he made them purified them to become a peculiar people zealous of good works and as uh, paul the apostle used that word he himself he must have remembered he thought about that he said when he was in the world how zealous he was for the jewish religion and he told them in acts of the apostle said i was zealous i was just like you i've been zealous for the law and zealous for the covenant and zealous for the ceremonial laws of the old covenant but now he says that zeal that was native then that was natural then that was historic then that was uh, just uh, a ritualistic thing but now the lord cleansed him and purged him and made that zeal now to be totally renewed and he said what god has done for me he does for everybody because now he redeems everyone and he makes us zealous of good works he said uh, titus you get to the people set everything in order that have gone out of order and those who do not know that the grace of god should bring transformation of life their mouths must be stopped and you must understand those people that are turning the grace of god into lasciviousness and they're subverting whole houses stop their mouth and then in verse 15 it says these six speak sound doctrine speak word of salvation speak the word of power purity speak the word of faith speak that should be a pattern and you exhort and you rebuke with all authority don't hold back don't minimize that authority when you stand as a preacher you stand as a representative of heaven when you stand as a person proclaiming the gospel and telling them how to prepare for the coming of the Lord you stand as an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ you stand as someone standing in in the place of the one that conquered Satan at Calvary and conquered evil spirits and conquered even the heart adamant hearts of men don't stand before the congregation and be like chicken they put water on a coward titus you are left there i should have been there but i could not be in every place and i told you to be there i appointed you as the lord has appointed me this you will do with all authority is telling all the preachers the same thing today you'll do it in jesus name did I hear an amen from the church? It says, let no man despise thee. Can you say that with me? Can you say that aloud? Uh, you see, there are sinners that are like to, the scoffers, the scorners, the backsliders who like to despise the authority of the word. And he said, Titus, when you are there, you stand like a champion. 
You stand like a conqueror. And you stand like somebody that comes to declare the only word that declares uh, the salvation of men and saves people from ruin and from eternal judgment. Therefore, do it authoritatively when you preach salvation. When you're talking about sanctification. When you talk about holiness, when you talk about a change of life, it says, let no man despise thee. Nobody will despise you. You will speak the word. And you speak that authoritatively. It will change the lives of people and families in your communities in Jesus' name. Let's come back to that verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, tell me, Jesus Christ. He's talking about the coming of the Lord. The coming of the Lord had been prophesied in the Old Testament. And then Jesus Christ himself spoke about that. He said, I'll come again in my father's house. How many mansions? He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Then he said, when I go. And he saw him going. And he saw him going. He said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Talking about the rapture there. And then not only about the rapture, he also spoke about the great tribulation. Because after the rapture, when the church has been taken away, According to the word of the Lord, there's going to be a period of the great tribulation. And that will take place for about seven years. And that seven years will be years of terror and years of suffering. Look at Matthew chapter 24. And I'm reading here from verse, uh, reading from verse 21. It says in verse 21, it says, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It will be the height of suffering, something that had never happened in all the sufferings of the war, Second, First World War, Second World War, and all the wars that you read about in the Bible and in contemporary times, it will be a terrible time. It says in verse 22, and except those days shall be shortened, there should, be no, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, shortened to seven years. And at that time, when the tribulation is taking place here, yeah, thank God I will not be here. If you are saved, you will not be here. Holy, you will not be here. Sanctified, you will not be here. Abiding in Christ, you will not be here. And then he tells us, while that is taking place here on earth, there will be something taking place in the zoo above. That is uh, taking place up in uh, heaven. Because it tells us in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. And as the voice of many waters. And as the voice of mighty sundering, saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the true sins of God. That means when the great tribulation is here on earth, there will be the marriage supper of the Lamb up yonder. And the Lord himself will dine and rejoice with his own people. After that great tribulation of seven years, then Christ will come. He will now come with the church, with the saints. At the rapture, he came for the saints, and he took them up. 
And now, after that great tribulation, you'll come with the church. What well, this is, we're looking at Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 29. And immediately after the tribulation of those days, you see that before the tribulation it comes and it catches the saints away. Then tribulation takes place here on earth. And because of the Jews, because of the elect, those days are shut into seven years. And after the seven years, immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give a light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then he tells us, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And they shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. With all those things to happen, what's the Lord telling us to do? What's he calling on you and on me and on the whole church to do? There's one word, get ready. Get ready. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. And that's what Jesus said over and over to his own disciples. That's what he has said over and over to his own church. And that's what the epistles tell us. That's what even the book of Revelation tells us. Get ready. If you are not born again yet, you are not ready for his coming. You are not saved. You are not sanctified. You are not ready for his coming. You'll get ready. Matthew chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 42. Matthew 24, verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Nobody can tell you the date, the time, the year. Ye know not when your Lord doth come. Verse 44. Therefore, here are the words of Jesus. Therefore, here are the words of our Savior. Therefore, be ye also ready. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye seek not, the Son of Man cometh. That's the Lord talking. And if there were no possibilities of anybody missing it, there will be no warning. And there will be no commandment like that. Get ready. You'll be ready in Jesus' name. Look at Matthew chapter 25, and I'm reading from verse 10. Matthew 25, reading from verse 10. And while they went, those were the foolish virgins to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready, that's the word, they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, foolish virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Then look at the conclusion, watch therefore. Because some are going to miss it, watch therefore. Because the careless are going to miss it, watch therefore. Because the backsliders are going to miss this, watch therefore. For ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Mark chapter 13. In Mark chapter 13, still telling his own disciples and telling you and me and telling the whole church. Mark chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 31. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, but of that day and that hour. No, is no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father, take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who led his house, and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh at evening, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly, 
He find you sleeping. You'll not be asleep when he comes. You'll be awake. Awake in righteousness. Awake in his power. Awake by spirit when he comes. And then he concludes. And what I say unto you. I say unto all. Everybody give it to me. Watch. What I say unto you. My immediate hearers. I say to every other person. Watch. Luke chapter 12. Reading from verse 37. It says in Luke chapter 12. The start is seven. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. It's not everybody that attends your services that will make it, but those who watch, those who have seen that the Lord is coming, and then they get prepared. He says, Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them siege down to meet. And will come forth and serve them. Look at verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also. You see that? The Lord telling us over and over. It's in Matthew. It's in Mark. It's in Luke. It's uh, in the rest of the New Testament. It says in verse 40. Be ye therefore ready also. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye seek not. Thank God you are going to be ready. Am I talking to somebody? I say, thank God you'll be ready. Yeah. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, uh, reading from verse 34. It says, take heed to yourselves, therefore, lest at any time your heart be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, cares of this life, cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. In Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, still telling us of the necessity of getting ready, preparing for the coming of the Lord. It's not just that, you know, the, the Lord is coming and so everybody uh, that has ever heard about the coming of the Lord, he'll just come and take them away. No, not at all. There's a preparation necessary. There's the readiness that the Lord himself has spoken about. He tells us in Revelation chapter 16 verse 15, Behold, I come as a thief. That means I'll come suddenly. That means I'll come when many people are sleeping, they are not prepared. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and he see his shame. I come back to that Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing. Of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking at the Word of God on readiness for Christ's glorious return. Readiness for Christ's glorious return. Three things we're going to look at. Number one, the bride's desire and longing for Christ's return. Desire and longing. Desire and expectation. Desire and waiting, desire and preparing the bride's desire and longing for Christ's return. Point number two, the bitter decline and looking back before Christ's return. The bitter decline and looking back before Christ's return. Number three, the believer's devotion while looking for Christ's return. The believer's devotion while looking for Christ's return. Number one, 
Tell me. The bride's desire and longing for Christ's return. I have you seen in that uh, Titus chapter 2? And it says, the grace of God has appeared unto us. We're saved. We're transformed. But we're not transformed just to remain here forever. There is a goal. There is a purpose. There is a reason. And it is to prepare us for the coming kingdom. It is to prepare us for that heavenly home. And so he says, must be longing for that. There must be that desire in the heart of the bride waiting for the bridegroom it's a natural scene for the bride to long for and to desire the return of the bridegroom who has gone on a long journey and jesus christ the head of the church is the bridegroom he is the husband and the church is the body of christ the church is the bride and the church the bride is waiting for is longing for is desiring the coming of the bridegroom and when it happens in a, in a normal family the wife waiting for the husband like that will keep herself pure in the absence of the husband and will prepare in every way necessary prepare the house prepare herself and prepare everything she'll prepare in every way necessary for his return and Christ is coming is coming for the purchased bride is coming for the purified bride is coming for the saved sanctified body of Christ is coming for the righteous ready saints and his faithful ones who are cleansed from all sin who are purified, who are made holy in heart, are waiting for him. That's why the Lord is saying, watch. That's why he's saying, pray. That's why he's saying, be ready. Uh, look at this uh, desire and the longing. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 20. It says, for our conversation is in heaven. We're here on earth. But we're looking forward to heaven. We're here on earth. We're dreaming of heaven. We're here on earth. We're desiring to get to heaven. It says for our conversation, a manner of life, and our heart, and our treasure, everything we can think about, our conversation is in heaven. And then it tells us, it says that from ways also, we look, that's the word, we're looking, we're longing, we're discerning. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes, he'll change a vile body. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. You underline that word, we're looking, we look. We look at Hebrews Hebrews chapter 9, and we read from verse 26. Hebrews chapter 9, reading from verse 26. Look at this, it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the age of the world, was as we're getting near the final climax of history it says he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself and as it is written as it is appointed unto men wants to die but after this the judgment look at this so christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that what tell me out aloud unto them that look for him it's not just everybody the people that are so busy with business they're so busy with the things of the world they're not looking for the coming of the lord they're not longing for the coming of the lord they might uh, you know attend uh, you know conference or crusade or whatever they're not looking for the uh, coming of the lord they might come to church service they might come to bible study they just come they're just religious they're not looking they're not waiting they're not desiring the coming of the lord but unto them unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation 
salvation is not coming to make any sacrifice anymore without sin offering is coming and for those who have taken him to be their lord and savior those are the people is coming for thank god i'll be one of them look at hebrews chapter 11 hebrews chapter 11 reading from verse 10 for he looked for his city you see the people that were saved even in the old covenant in the old testament they were looking forward looking forward looking for that glorious appearing of the lord and looking for getting to heaven for he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is god when he comes he'll take us to heaven and that's a place built by God himself. But we're looking for that. Look at verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, but now, but now, after they were saved, but now, after they made purified, but now, after they were enlightened, but now, they desire a better country. That is to say, and heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. And we need, we need to get prepared. We need to keep on looking so that by the grace of God, that day will not come upon you unprepared in Jesus' name. Second Peter chapter 3, looking for that blessed hope. Looking for the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 11, seeing the end that all these things shall be dissolved. What does that mean? All the things you see in the world, all the things people are building, all the things people are running after, all the things they are sacrificing their souls and their life and their future and their destiny for, all those things they are sacrificing for to raise up and to build, they want to get this and get this and get that, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Look at verse 12. Tell me. You're looking for it. You're looking for it. You'll be looking in Jesus' name. You are longing for that glorious appearance. It says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, what are we doing? We look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless have you noticed something there in verse 12 the word looking is there in verse 13 the word look is there and in verse 14 the word look is there come back to verse 12 looking for an evening unto the coming of the day of god when in the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the element shall melt with fervent cheat. It says, all that you see in this world, they're going to be destroyed. They're going to melt away. And if that's all you have, if that's all you give your life to, is that what you give your time to? Is that what you can lay claim to? I have this, I have this, I have that. Everything will be burnt up with fire. And it says, the only saving grace. And the only thing you ought to have is the very fact that you're looking for the coming of the Lord. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. It says the present world is polluted, is corrupt, is dirty, is defiling, is being prepared for doom, destruction, and damnation. It says, nevertheless, even though the things of this world, they're going to melt away, and they're going to be destroyed. It says, we're looking, looking for that which is new, new heaven and a new earth. Look at verse 14. It says, wherefore, beloved, 
see that you look for such things. If you are really looking for something and you are longing, here is something you do. Be diligent that she may be found of him in peace. Peace with God. Peace with man. Peace with your family. Peace with members of the church. Peace with people in your community. You are found in him in peace. Then he says, without spot and blameless. All that is telling us is that we need to be ready. The Lord is coming. We are going to be ready. I said you are going to be ready. Whatever it takes, you do it at the right time. You do it even now. So that by the grace of God, when it comes, you will not be left behind. We're looking at Jude. Just one chapter. Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. Verse 21. Look at the word again. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus unto eternal life. You see that? It says, we keep ourselves. Keep yourself in the love of God. The love that saved you, keep yourself there. The love that transformed your life, keep yourself there. The love that has sanctified you, keep yourself there. The love that has gone to prepare a place for you in heaven, keep yourself there. Keep yourselves in the love of God and looking up for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Verse 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Thank God he will keep you from falling. Unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. As uh, we look at all this, it's giving us assurance that Christ is coming. And we need to desire, we need to look for that blessed appearance. And we need to get ready. Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and he also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, which is to come, which is to come. The Almighty gives us assurance is coming again. We need to be ready. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. Revelation chapter 2, verse 25. But that which ye have already hold fast until when? Until when? Till I come. It's telling us it's coming again. You have salvation, hold it fast. Sanctification, hold it fast. You have conviction, hold it fast. And you have the doctrine, hold that fast. You have the understanding of the scriptures, hold that fast. You have some commitment, consecration to the Lord, hold that fast. It says, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. And he that overcometh, not every day can hurry, not those who are fallen and arising, not those who are sinning privately, not those who have given their hearts even to the devil after they said they are born again, but he that overcometh. Any overcomer here today? I said any overcomer here today? Look up here and see the overcomer. I'm an overcomer. You'll be in Jesus' name. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end. Until when? Until when? You'll not die by the wayside. You'll not stop your journey halfway through. You'll not stop your conviction halfway through. You will continue until the very end. And by the grace of God, you'll make it on that day in Jesus' name. 
he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end to him will I give power over the nations chapter 3 of Revelation verse 11 in chapter 3 verse 11 behold I come quickly hold that fast when thou hast that no man take thy crown understand any time temptation comes is a plan of the devil so that he'll take your crown but he will not succeed Anytime you are called to compromise, you've been walking the righteous way and then you see something and then that thing looks exciting, interesting and inviting and then the devil is saying, why don't you drop what you have and take this new thing? That's the temptation of the devil so that he'll make you miss your crown and miss heaven and miss the rapture. It will not succeed over you in Jesus' name. Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast that no man take thy crown him that overcometh the promise is always for the overcomer not for the compromisers not for the backsliders he that overcometh will i make a pillar in the temple of my god and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. It will happen to you. I'm looking at Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, reading from verse 15. Behold, I come. You see, in all these verses of Revelation, chapter 2, I come. Chapter 3, I come. Here in chapter 16, behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. The last chapter of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the says of the prophecy of this book. It's telling us that when it comes, going with the Lord is not automatic. I'm religious, not enough. I have some sprinkling of righteousness, not enough. I've heard about holiness. I'm trying to get holy, not enough. I'm trying to get pure. Only the challenges in my place of work, the challenges are too many. Not enough. But the people that keep the watch of the Lord, and they keep that word of the Lord with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and they pure through and through. They're holy through and through. They're righteous through and through. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the seas of the prophecy of this book. Look at verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his works shall be. The people who tell us that, you know, it doesn't look at your works, it doesn't look at your action, it doesn't look at your behavior, it doesn't see anything you do, it only sees Jesus around you and in you. That's a lie of false prophets. It says, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Look at verse 20. In verse 20, it tells us, still about the assurance of his coming. Thank God he's coming. Look at verse 20 here. He which testifies these things says, Surely I come quickly. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And when he comes, I pray you'll not be found wanting in Jesus' name. Point number two, the bitter decline and looking back before Christ's return. And, and there is a story that uh, Jesus himself made allusion to. Let me read the story to you first and then uh, we'll look at what Jesus said about that. We're looking at um, Genesis chapter 19. Genesis chapter 19. Uh, 
the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was about to come. The angels had been sent from heaven and fire was to devastate and destroy all of Sodom and Gomorrah and all the cities and villages around. And the angels, uh, in response to the prayer of Abraham, had come to Lot and the wife and the two daughters. And he told them, escape, get out of this place because destruction is coming. Genesis chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 16. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord be merciful unto him and they brought him out brought him forth and set him without outside the city and it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said escape for thy life here is uh, the divine commandment escape for thy life here is the urgent thing to do escape for thy life here is the moment of escaping uh, the judgment coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee. Neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. You would have thought that the man would be so grateful to God and he'll run immediately and depart immediately. Verse 18. And Lord said unto them, tell me, Oh, not so, my Lord. You know the people that modify the word of God? Not so, my Lord. You know the people that are just the commandments of the Lord? Not so, my Lord. You know the people that are sick while they are hearing the word of God? I don't think it's all that serious. I don't think it's all that urgent. I don't think you have to go immediately. I don't think you have to have all these qualities and qualifications. After all, other people don't accept that. Other people don't believe that. Other people don't emphasize that. Without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. I don't, I don't think it's all that serious. I don't think that everybody has to be saved. After repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't think it's that serious. I don't think everybody has to make restitution and whatever it is you have stolen, take everything back. I don't think it's all that serious. I don't think that, you know, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, that was it then, but I don't think that, you know, look at all the churches and look at all the people. Is everybody born again in that sense? Oh, not so, my Lord. The people that think they can adjust the word of God and get by. Here was the problem of Lord. And here was the problem of the whole family. And they were lingering. I want to tell you delay is dangerous. Lingering is costly. Looking back is damnable. Look at verse 26. In verse 26, but his wife looked back. From behind him, and she became, tell me, a pillar of salt, arguing of the angels, modifying and adjusting the instruction of the angels. Just a little deviation. Yes, we'll go, but not to the mountain top. And just a little departure from what we're learning, it brings damnation and doom and destruction. In fact, it didn't affect just, uh, just a lot alone or just the wife alone. Don't you know what happened? After the wife became a pillar of salt and then they got to the cave and then the daughter said, well, there's no man to be with us. And eventually the, the father came, went into them and they had two children, the name of the one Moab and the name of the other Ammon. And if you look at the Ammonites and you look at the Moabites, millions and millions and millions of them all over the generations they didn't go the way of the Lord, they perished. You know, if his wife had been there, 
Those daughters will not have done that. But the wife, looking back, caused a problem for herself and missed the glory land and missed paradise and missed heaven and then caused problem for the daughters also because the mother was not around. That's why we're saying delay is dangerous. The foolish virgins delayed and they missed heaven. If salvation is necessary, delay to be saved is damnable, punishable. If uh, restitution is necessary, delay restitution is dangerous, is damnable. If coming out from among them is the watch of the Lord Almighty Himself, not coming out or lingering or delaying, that's very dangerous. If sanctification is necessary, if holiness is indispensable, not getting that to not getting that sanctification is very much dangerous and the people who delay let's look at what Jesus said we're looking at Luke chapter 17 Luke chapter 17 I'm reading from verse 28 Luke chapter 17 verse 28 likewise also as it was in the days of Lord they did eat they drank they bought they sold they planted they built it that's all people are doing today. They don't have time to come for Bible study because they eat, they drink, they buy, they sell, they plant, they build. They don't have time for their soul to prepare for heaven. They don't have time to pray. They don't have time to seek the face of the Lord. They don't have time to get the strength and the power to be spiritual. Why? Because they eat, they drink, they buy, they sell, they plant, they build. They don't have time to serve the Lord and give their time to evangelism because after they have got one degree, they want to get another degree. After they have got one work, they want to get another work. After they are establishing one employment, they want to get something or do some over time. Why? Because they eat, because they drink, because they buy, they sell, they plant, they build. That's all their life. It's all in a circle. And Jesus Christ said likewise. Also, as it was in the days of Lord, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but the same day. That Lot went out of Sodom. He trained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30. Are you there? Verse 30. I said, Are you there? Okay, we're going to read together. One, two, three, go. You can read better than that. For the last time now. Even so, and the Lord is telling us that there will be people that give their lives and they give their heart and they give all their attention and they give all their strategy to amassing the wealth of this world. And they give their time to just this and that material things. And it says, even so shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Look at verse 32, 1, 2, 3, go. If you are going to remember, say it aloud. If you are going to help your wife to remember, say it aloud. If you are going to tell your husband to remember how to say it. If your family is going to get ready for that coming of the Lord, can you say that? In your office, while they are tempting you and while they are telling you to comprehend, pushing you, do this, do this, will you remember? Remember Lord's why. Times of celebration, times of, uh, you know, I've just built a house and we're going to rejoice and give glory to God. Worldliness will come in. Remember Lord's wife. And then at the time when maybe you are going to do an exam and I say next blow here and this one here, uh, whatever it is, would you remember? Remember Lord's wife. And when you're traveling, I want to travel to China, travel to Japan, travel to Taiwan, travel everywhere. I'm going making business. Remember Lord's wife. And when you are 
are joining yourself to an unbeliever when the Lord has said be not unequally yoked together with an unbeliever you're making business here and business here because this thing is moving and we're going to get money and we're going to get this and that will you remember remember Lord's wife and when it is uh, maybe you're having challenge in your, your place in your in your family and uh, you know your in-laws are saying why don't you kick her away and marry another one they don't accept a second wife in your church uh, outside in your village there are many people waiting for you here and they're ready to marry you why don't you just kick that one out and marry another one remember Lord's wife and when the things of this world occupies your heart and it appears that you are getting buried in all the activities of the world and you are not remembering the coming of the Lord it says remember Lord's wife thank God I will remember I say thank God I will remember never allow anything in this world to take your heart away from the expectation of the coming of the Lord once again verse 32 everybody remember Lord's wife we're looking at Luke chapter 9 Luke chapter 9 and we're reading from verse 62 Luke chapter 9 we're reading from verse 62 it tells us in verse 62 and Jesus said unto him no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back and looking back and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Lord is saying, if you are going to get ready, you laid your hands on the plow and you have been looking back. You say, Lord, forgive me today. I repent today. I come back today. I will not miss heaven. I said, I will not miss heaven. I said, I will not miss heaven. You'll not miss heaven in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 12, we're reading from verse 45. Luke chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 45. It says, But and if that servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth is coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and the maidens, and to eat and to drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. In a day when he looketh not for him. Are there days like that in your life? Day of temptation? And you say, I'll commit this one sin. Later I will repent. I don't think the Lord will come today. And then you'll make a business deal. At this fraud, I will take part in this and get money. Man must eat and man must get money this time. Uh, you know, holiness, holiness every time. This one, I will do this one. In a day when he look at not for him. I don't think the Lord will come at this time. Let me go through what I'm going to do. And then later I will repent. It says, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and as an hour when he is not aware i will cut him asunder i will appoint his portion with the unbelievers will he get to heaven i said that backslider will he get to heaven that careless uh, fellow will he get to heaven having the doctrine in the head not having it in the heart will he get to heaven ah uh, you are not sure you will not get to, because it says he will this is the Lord Jesus Christ talking and he says he will appoint his portion with the unbelievers having been in the midst of the saints all these years I will not end my life in the portion of the unbelievers in Jesus name you say it for yourself, say it for yourself. Having been with the believers all these years and walking with them and eating with them and having a retreat with them, having a conference with them, going in and out with believers. Look at the believers here. And then when the rapture will happen, and then the Lord, you stay back. Where are you going? You cannot go because of this and because of this. God forbid in your life. You will not perish. I said you will not perish. You will not end your life with the sinners and the unbelievers and the idol worshippers in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 38. Hebrews chapter 10. We're reading from verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. How are you going to live? The just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, 
look up at me here. You know, so I, I know you know that verse of scripture, but you know, many people they say, I am so and so, I am such and such in the church. My position, my record, the work I have done, and people know my sacrifice. And people know what I've done here, what I've done here, what I've done here. And when they read the scripture, they no more apply to themselves. That's why they become careless. That's why they compromise. That's why they go back to sin. That's why they backslide. That's why they eat the sacrifice of idol worshippers. That's how they allow their daughters to almost become prostitutes. That's why they allow their sons to do evil because they say, God understands my position, how I stand, my standing in a church you call Deeper Life Bible Church. And therefore, they excuse themselves from the life and the commitment of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And they don't think they are part of the enemy. man. Look at the verse 38 again. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man, that means anyone, draw back, tell me, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But start in I praise the Lord, but you are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Give me a good amen. amen. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul, I will endure till the very end. I said I will endure to the very end. Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 20, look at the danger, the danger of sliding back, the danger of looking back, the danger of going back, the danger of laying your hands on the plow and then looking back. And the danger of committing yourself to the Lord, consecrating yourself to the Lord, living a holy life, experience sanctification, and then going back. And you never mention holiness anymore in your life. Look at verse 20. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end of them, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. I pray that will not happen to you. Amen. Did I hear any amen over there? Amen. Verse 21, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it is happened unto them, not unto me, not unto us. It is happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again. And the soap, the pig, the swine that was washed into a wallowing in the mire. I pray that will not happen to you. Look at Second John, only one chapter. Second John, reading here from verse eight. Second John, verse eight. Look to yourselves. Take care of your life. Take care of your experiences. Take care of your standing. Take care of your conviction. Look to yourselves that we lose not the things which we have wrought but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresses, whosoever, what does that mean? Whosoever, I say, what does that mean? Anybody, anyone, bishop, overseer, pastor, preacher, deeper life member, deeper life minister, anyone. Whosoever transgresses, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, what's the doctrine of Christ? Be born again. He that abideth, what's the doctrine of Christ? Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of Christ and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. That's 
the doctrine of Christ, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's the doctrine of Christ. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. That's the doctrine of Christ. Tell ye the city of Jerusalem, until ye be filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost, which shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. That's the doctrine of Christ. And when it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, that's the doctrine of Christ. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, as not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son, if there come any unto you. And bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. I will not be partaker of anybody's deed. I said I'll not be partaker of anybody's evil deeds. We're looking at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Open your Bible. God bless you. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15. Looking how? Diligently. Looking, not carelessly, flippantly, frivolously, without any attention. Take it to yourself at your life. Looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God. Let's any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and many be defiled. Looking back is dangerous. Looking back is damnable. Looking back is punishable. You will not look back. We're coming back to Titus chapter 2 verse 13. Titus chapter 2 Verse 13, it tells us in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. What kind of people? I said, what kind of people? A peculiar people. What are they doing? The zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. Point number three now. The believer's devotion while looking for Christ's return. As we are waiting the coming of the Lord, we are not waiting in idleness. Our expectation is not idle expectation and it's not also a crowded life of earthly engagement it's a life of daily seeking the lost you're waiting for the coming of the lord you're expecting the coming of the lord you do that with daily seeking the lost bringing sinners to repentance and to faith in christ bringing sinners to salvation conversion change of life, the new birth, righteousness. It's feeding converts and babes in Christ with the milk of the world. You say you're expecting the coming of the Lord. As you're expecting the coming of the Lord, you're looking for new converts, you're looking for new babes in Christ, and you're helping them to understand the word of the Lord because that's what Jesus said we should be doing. We're expecting the coming of the Lord and because of that we're busy. We're strengthening weak believers. They don't know that they need to know and we're strengthening them. We're helping them to be strong in the faith, strong in the grace of God, strong in the word of the Lord, strong in their conviction and strong in the life of the believer. We're reaching out to backsliders and we're helping them to come, to come back 
to restore them and to make them come back to the old time first faith first love for the lord and we are exhorting and instructing christians to holiness we're spending our time our talent our treasure all we have to build for christ and build like christ and build with christ we're daily laboring to prepare as many souls as possible for christ's return first thessalonians chapter one first thessalonians chapter one from verse seven see what these believers did how they prepared others how they helped others while they were looking, while they were expecting, while they were waiting for the coming of the Lord. It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7, So that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God. God is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living God, the living and true God. Look at this verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Even Jesus will deliver us from the wrath to come. As those believers who are waiting, they are also walking. Why were they walking? Why were they laboring? Why were they making the greatest effort possible to bring others to the Lord? Because of what the Lord had said. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, eh, that's what I've given my life to. And I'm passing that to you, verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And said unto them, occupy till I come. Can we say that together? That was, that's what he said. This last week, Monday, did you occupy you get occupied Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and from week to week, in which way have you been occupied? Who have you spoken to? Who have you touched? Whose lives have you changed? Who have you preached to? Who have you read the word of God to? And when you take the tract and it's given to us, who have you read that tract to? Who have you led to prayer? Who have you led to conversion? And here is what Jesus said. We do what uh, the governments of the world say we should do every time. And we do what the leaders of the world, what they tell us to do. We do that every time. But the word of our master, the word of our Lord, the word of our Savior. And he says, we should do this until he comes. There are even some places in churches now, they're talking about retirement from the work of God. Jesus never told Peter or John or Paul or any of those apostles, when you get to this period, then you can retire. He said, occupy until I come. The people who were evangelizing before, occupy until I come. Singing before, occupy until I come. Distributing the word, occupy until I come. Go touch lives and go and reach every home and every house and occupy until I come. The population of the world is increasing. Go tell them, go tell them, go tell them, and go bring them into the kingdom of God. Occupy until I come. He has not come yet. You cannot stop. You will not stop. You will continue to do this until it comes in Jesus' name. Uh, let me show you this. Look at this. First Kings chapter 20. First Kings, I'm reading here from chapter 20. First Kings chapter, tell me your chapter there. 
chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 39. Look at this and look at how it applies. Uh, you know, maybe it's your neighbor, maybe it's your husband, and maybe it's your wife, and maybe it's your maybe a believer, a friend. Look at first Kings chapter 20, verse 39. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Thy servant went out into the midst of the battle. And behold, the man turned aside and brought a man unto me and said, Keep this man, keep this man, keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life, or else thou shalt pay a talent of silver. Verse 40. And as thy servant was busy, tell me, here and there, is that applicable to you? You're so busy, you cannot evangelize. You're so busy, you cannot save the souls, seek for the souls that Jesus died for. And even when other people have sought, and they've given the altar call, and the uh, follow-up card is your hand, you put it inside your Bible, and you do nothing about it. You're busy here and there. Thank God the crusade is over. Thank God the meeting is over. Thank God the retreat is over. And then all the cast we have received, everything is there. And we go back to the life of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They bought, they sold, they built, they planted. And so even so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And we don't have any time to do what we are called to do. From today things will change. I said things will turn around. He said, as thy servant was to be seated here and there, he was gone. And the king of Israel said unto him, so shall thy judgment be. Thou hast decided it. I pray you will not come to judgment. The Lord is asking you a question. I'm going to read that question from John chapter 21. John chapter 21. I'm reading from verse 15. So when they are dying, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Look at the fish on the ground. Lovest me more than these? You want to take them to the market? You want to take them to a particular company? You want to be looking for a refrigerator to put them inside? Lovest thou me more than this? Here is food. Here is fish. You want to just start and boiling and uh, frying and eating? Lovest thou me more than this? He saith unto him, Ye Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Leave the fish alone then. All these extracurricular things that went, leave them alone. Feed my lambs. Verse 16. And he said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? That's, you can put your name there. And the Lord is asking you today, souls are dying, souls are perishing. The people who have just come to the Lord, they need somebody to put them through and show them the way of light. Do you really love me? Lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Yea, Lord, that knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him, The certain Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he says unto him, The third time, lovest thou me? And he says unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus says unto him, Tell me out aloud. Feed my sheep. That's what he's telling you. Will you obey? I said, Will you obey? Look at verse 21. Peter, seeing him, says unto Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? You see, that's that your other people. Jesus just told Peter now, you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I do. Feed my lamb, feed my sheep, feed my lamb. And then Peter saw John. He said, if that's what I'm going to do, how about this man? What shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. You are not going to be looking at other people. This work the Lord has given you to do, you will rise up and you will do it, and you will do it every time in Jesus' name. I've lost the amen of our people. And 
how, so, how often are we to do that? How frequently are we to commit ourselves to that? Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter, chapter 5 verse 42. And I want you to look for one word here, just one word. It says in chapter 5 and verse 42, and daily, underline that, underline that, and daily, what did I say should do to that? I said, what did I say should do to that? You know what? Look up here for a moment. There are people now that think that, you know, Monday, okay, that's for Bible study, that, and no more. Thursday, that's revival hour, that, and no more. But you see here, the early church, they understood that Christ was coming, and were asking, what can I do before he comes? How far can I reach before he comes? Who can I touch before he comes? Who am I going to get to the kingdom before he comes? And so they did it every day. They did it every day. Look at this. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. That's how they did, how they did it. Look at chapter 16. Chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 4. Chapter 16, verse 4. And as they went through the cities, they didn't just stay in one locality in one local government, in one city, it says, as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep, which were ordained by the apostles and the elders which were at Jerusalem. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number, tell me the word, daily, daily walking every day, serving every day, preaching every day, evangelizing every day, Daily. Look at chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 16. Chapter 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was touched in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons. And in the market, what's the word there? Daily with them that match was in marketplace, street corner, anywhere. They did it every day. Chapter 19 from verse 9. Chapter 19 from verse 9. It says, But when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing, what's the word there? Daily in the school of one tyrannous. If they didn't have a church, a building, they used the school premises. If they didn't have that, they used the marketplace. Anywhere, everywhere, they were doing it daily. And look at how it continued. Not something that, you know, they were on fire for one week, on fire for one month, and then that was it. Look at verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years. So that, look at this, look at this. So that all they that dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. It will start from today. It will start with you. It will start with every one of us. And daily, we're going to do it in Jesus' name. And was it only for the preachers? Only for the pastors? Only for the apostles? Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? You'll do it in Jesus' name. You give your heart, you give your time, you give your talent, you give your skill, you give everything you've got, and you say, I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord because I'm waiting for the coming of the Lord. I'm not going to wait in idleness. I'm not going to wait just being lazy. I'm not going to wait not doing anything. I'm going to reach out to souls so that through me, multitudes will come to know the Lord. It will happen in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and tell the Lord, we're waiting for the coming of the Lord. You understand? You have the assurance 
assurance Jesus is coming he says get ready get ready get holy and get ready and do your restitution get ready whatever it is God has called you to do he has told you this this and this there's no looking back there's no lingering you're saying oh Lord I am ready I will do what you have called me to do and then you have the desire you have the longing you're not going to look back and you're going to keep on working for the Lord until he comes you'll be ready in Jesus name open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer